Ave Maria Purissima, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. In her last public interview, Sister Lucia told Father Augustine Fuentes, as the vice postulator for the cases of uh, Blessed Francisco and Blessed Jacinta, quote, Father, the Most Holy Virgin is very sad because no one has paid any attention to her message, neither the good nor the bad. The good continue on their way, but without getting any importance to her message. The bad, not seeing the punishment of God actually falling upon them, continue their life of sin without even caring about the message. But believe me, Father, God will chastise the world, and this will be in a terrible manner. Close quote. Well, the Holy Virgin is very sad because no one has paid any attention to her message, neither the good nor the bad. Okay, on Sunday we consider the miracle of the sun as a historical fact and as the fulfillment of prophecy. We saw there are accounts published before the miracle. They're mocking the predictions. There are testimonies written, taped, and filmed from massive numbers of the 77,000 witnesses, many of whom were not believers. There are photographs of the crowd viewing the miracle. We saw there were di distant witnesses who could not possibly accuse of being under some sort of a group hypnosis or, or suggestion. We saw besides the precise fulfillment of this prophecy, which in and of itself can only be a direct act of God, the miracle of the sun is itself far outside the course of nature and there can, therefore also can be only explained as a direct act of God himself. We consider the miracle in itself as an apocalyptic sign and as an unmistakable confirmation that Our Lady had been speaking to the children. We concluded because, that because God never acts without a purpose, then when he performs a miracle of unprecedented proportions, that it's a sign pointing towards a message which is itself of un unprecedented importance. And the apocalyptic overtones of the miracle itself point toward apocalyptic overtones in the message. Then yesterday we began considering the message itself. We saw that vision of hell, a reality that's been almost forgotten in our sad times and that it plays a central role in the message. We briefly reviewed the church's teaching regarding hell, including the fact, all modern hallucinations to the contrary, that we cannot dare to hope that all men are saved, since Pius II specifically condemned the statement that all Christians are to be saved. We saw it would be very difficult to overestimate the impact the vision of hell had on the three children. We saw that in the 1940s, the Pope warned us that the mankind had lost its sense of sin and reached a degree of wickedness that had never been seen before in the history of the world. We then briefly considered the problem of lukewarmness, which is a terrifying state that people can fall into. They basically is cutting corners in the service of God and refusal to make the sacrifice he, he He's asking, and that people that fall into this state are they're basically impervious to correction, quite, quite uh, significantly different from a really serious sinner. When you offer correction to a serious sinner, sometimes he'll take it, and sometimes he won't, but you're going to get pushback if he does it. There's going to be a reaction, a lukewarm person that turns into jokes and excuses. We briefly reviewed the church's teaching regarding venial sin and saw that venial sin is an offense against God, that no circumstance or motive whatsoever can ever justify committing, that we are bound to embrace any other alternative, however painful or however difficult it might be, rather than commit a single venial sin, and that a venial sin is an insult offered by a contemptible nothing to the infinite majesty of God. We also saw that if we don't strive manfully to avoid deliberate venial sins, but instead regularly indulge ourselves in our own venial sinful desires, then we have trained our will. And we've trained our will, in fact, to yield in the presence of temptation. We've seen that once you have a weak, flabby will like that, then when we're hit with a strong temptation, we're going to fall. We saw that if we're serious about our salvation, we cannot afford to be casual about venial sin since no one becomes wicked all at once. It's only the man who begins to give way in little things and allows himself certain unlawful liberty, <clears throat> who at length sinks down into deadly sins, wrecks his whole life, and purchases for himself damnation. We then briefly reviewed the church's teaching regarding mortal sin. We saw that a single mortal sin deprives the soul of sanctifying grace, 
That's that supernatural life in the soul. It makes the soul an enemy of God, takes away all the merits of its good acts, deprives it of the right to everlasting happiness in heaven, and finally makes it deserving of everlasting punishment in hell. We saw there are three things necessary to make a sin mortal. That's serious matter, sufficient reflection, and full consent of the will. We also saw that after committing a mortal sin, there are four possible states of the soul. First possible state is reprobate sins. When a sinner, as punishment for his sin, no longer seriously, intelligently cares about his salvation. Defective contrition. That's when the sinner has some uh, regret for sin, but lacks a firm purpose of amendment. Imperfect contrition. When the sinner has a firm purpose of amendment, but is moved by less perfect motives than the love of God. For example, the fear of hell. In perfect contrition, the sinner is moved by regret for sin on account of the wrong done to God, who is infinitely good and worthy of all love. We saw that it's completely impossible for sinners with a reparate sense or with defective contrition to make good confessions and be reconciled to God. We saw in order to make a good confession and be reconciled to God, in other words, in order to be validly abs absolved, a sinner must either have imperfect or perfect contrition. We saw, according to the teaching of those great fathers and doctors of the church, St. Basil the Great, St. Jerome, St. Ambrose, St. Cyril of Alexandria, St. John Chrysostom, St. Augustine, and St. Alphonsus, they all teach the same thing. That just as God has fixed for man the number of his days, the degrees of health and talent he'll give to him, so also God has determined the number of mortal sins that he'll pardon that man. When that number is completed, he'll pardon no more. We saw that God waits with patience until the number of sins is committed. When the measure of guilt is fil filled up, he waits no longer but chastises the sinner. That is, when the number of sins is completed, he takes vengeance on the sinner. And we close with that saying of St. Gregory the Great. He who has promised pardon to penitents has not promised tomorrow to sinners. So much for the review. Now before we turn to the second aspect of the message of Fatima, which pertains to the salvation of nations and the social order, there's one last detail regarding the salvation of individuals that we did not consider last night, and that's the grace of final perseverance. The grace of final perseverance is the gift from God of dying in the state of grace. This is a supreme grace because it's a critical grace. The guy that dies in the state of grace is saved. He might go to purgatory for a time, but he won't go to hell. He's saved. And here's the point. We cannot merit final perseverance. We can't merit it. St. Alphonsus discusses this. Quote, The grace of salvation is not a single grace, but a chain of graces, all of which are at last linked with the grace of final perseverance. We cannot merit final perseverance. We ought also always to ask for it every day till our death, if we wish to obtain it. Many sinners, by the help of God's grace, are converted and receive pardon. But then, because they neglect to ask for perseverance, they fall again and lose all. Close quote, St. Alphonsus. He's a doctor of moral theology for the Universal Church. Now, once we understand this, we can start to appreciate how much Our Lady really loves us, since she made it so easy for each one of us to receive this supreme grace. On July 13th, Our Lady told the three children, If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved. I will come to ask for the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays of the month. In December of 1925, she came, along with the Christ child, to Sister Lucia's cell. Here's Sister Lucia's account. It's written in a third person. I've, for clarity's sake, I've inserted names. Quote, The Most Holy Virgin appeared to Sister Lucia. And by Our Lady's side, elevated on a luminous cloud, was the child Jesus. The Most Holy Virgin rested her hand on Sister Lucia's shoulder. And as she did so, she showed Sister Lucia a heart encircled by thorns, which she was holding in her other hand. At the same time, the child said, have compassion on the heart of your most holy mother, surrounded with thorns with which great ungrateful men pierce it at every moment, and there's no one to make an act of reparation to remove them. Then the most holy virgin said to Sister Lucia, Look, my daughter, at my heart, surrounded by thorns, with which ungrateful men pierce me at every moment by their blasphemies and ingratitude. You at least try to console me and announce in my name that I promise to assist at the moment of death with all the graces necessary for salvation. All those who on the first Friday, of, or first Saturday of five consecutive months shall confess 
receive Holy Communion, recite five decades of the rosary, and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on the 15 mysteries of the rosary with intention of making reparation to me. Now that is an astounding promise. Our Lady promises the gift of, to offer us the gift of final perseverance. It's a gift which not even the greatest saint can ever merit. And she promises that gift for making the first Saturdays. There's absolutely no proportion between the greatness of the gift and the very small effort required on our part to receive it. It shows the unbelievable intercessory power of Our Lady on behalf of sinners. Talk about hope saving us from the fires of hell. As soon as a child makes his first communion, parents should make every effort, whatever effort, whatever sacrifice is required to get him to make the five first Saturdays. Even if he should, uh, good Lord forbid, uh, quit wearing his brow and scapula and start leading a bad life when he gets older, the parents can be confident that at the very least, at the moment of death, he'll receive the graces necessary for salvation. That's not just true for kids that have made their first communion. Each one of us should also make every effort, every sacrifice necessary to ensure that we too can re receive this extraordinary assistance from Our Lady at the hour of our death. The promise attached to the first Saturdays is just another proof of Our Lady's love for weak sinners. As St. John Chrysostom says, Quote, Mary's immense mercy saves a great number of unhappy persons who, according to the norms of divine justice, would be damned. Close quote. St. Thomas Aquinas, quote, Through Mary's intercession, many souls are in paradise who would not be there had she not interceded for them. For God has entrusted her with the keys and treasures of the heavenly kingdom. What about those that have to work on Saturdays and simply can't meet the conditions? Sister Lucia's confessor, Father Gonsalves, asked several questions. If one cannot fulfill all the conditions on a Saturday, can it be done on a Sunday? People in the country, for example, will not be able very often because they live quite far away. Why five Saturdays, not nine or seven, in honor of the sorrows of Our Lady? Close quote. Our Lord gave the answers to Sister Lucia that very night. Quote, the practice of this devotion will be equally acceptable on a Sunday following the first Saturday when my priests, for a just cause, allow it to souls, close quote. On yet another occasion, the Christ child appeared to Sister Lucia, who took the occasion to ask our Lord, my Jesus, many souls find it difficult to confess on a Saturday. Will you allow confession within eight days to be valid? The Lord answered, yes, it can be even made later on, provided the souls in the state of grace when they receive me on the first Saturday, and that they have the intention of making reparation to the Sacred Heart of Mary. My Jesus, and those who forget to form this intention, they can form with their next confession, taking advantage of their first opportunity to go to confession. So it's really important to know, as long as we're in the state of grace, when we make our communion reparation, we have eight days or even longer to make our confession, also with make the intention of making reparation to the Immaculate Heart. And furthermore, with the per permission of a priest, the communion recitation of the rosary, the 15-minute meditation can be transferred to Sunday. You need a priest's permission for that. In response to the question about the number of Saturdays, why five Saturdays? Our Lord answered, <clears throat> My daughter, the reason is simple. There are five kinds of offenses and blasphemies committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Number one, blasphemies against the Immaculate Conception. Number two, blasphemies against her perpetual virginity. Number three, blasphemies against her divine maternity, while refusing at the same time to recognize her as mother of men. Number four, the blasphemies of those who seek publicly to sow in the hearts of children indifference or scorn or even hatred towards this Immaculate Mother. Number five, the offenses of those who outrage her directly in her holy images. There, my daughter, is the reason why the Immaculate Heart of Mary inspired me to request this small act of reparation and in consideration of it to move my mercy to forgive souls who have had the misfortune to offend her. Close quote. So in regards to blasphemies against her Immaculate Conception, we're making reparation for the Eastern Orthodox and Protestants, among others. In regards to, because they both, they deny that. In regards to blasphemies against her perpetual virginity, we're making reparation for Protestants, among others. In, re in regards to blasphemies against her divine maternity, while refusing at the same time to recognize her as the mother of men, we're making reparation for Protestants, among others. In regard to blasphemies of those who publicly seek to sow in the hearts of children indifference or scorn or even hatred towards this maggot mother, we're making reparation for the Protestants, among others. 
In regards to blasphemies against the fence, those who outrage her directly in her holy images were making, again, reparation for the Protestants, among others. Would, if that were all we were making reparation for. In a comment published in 1980, the leader of the Blue Army, Father Richard, said, or asked, who could have imagined 50 years ago that these five great offenses against Mary would spread within the clergy of the Catholic Church herself? And that a great number of baptized and catechized children in our parishes would not even know any longer how to say the Hail Mary. Close quote. And that is where we're at. That is where it's amazing how many times you meet somebody that doesn't know how to say the Hail Mary. What's going on? Our Lady loves us. She doesn't want anyone to go to hell. If she showed the children that ocean of hellfire with immense number of damned souls tumbling around and shrieking, it's because she's warning us. She doesn't want any of us to land there. And then she shows her motherly compassion and care for the message of the first Saturdays, a practice with a promise attached of her assistance at the moment of death with all the graces necessary for salvation. She offers us final perseverance for doing that. Now there's a handout that will be available after on the way out and it's got all these details on the CD. Don't, don't worry if you didn't remember all that. It's all on there. Everything I just told you I made a, a little handout with that on the first Saturday. It's really important. Okay. Let's turn to the second aspect of the message. It pertains to salvation of nations and the social order and to persecution or freedom for the church. The historical part of this part of the conference I'll draw heavily from the work of Frere Michel, the Most Holy Trinity. We'll review that part of the message. Sister Lucia, quote, Our Lady said to us so kindly and so sadly, You have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To say them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. The war is going to end. This is World War I. The world is going to end, but if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. When you see a night illumined by an unknown light, know that this is the great sign given to you by God that he's about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the Church and of the Holy Father. To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, various nations will be annihilated. There's four points here. One, world peace has been entrusted to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Two, Our Lady made three requests, placed three conditions for world peace. Three, Our Lady promised peace in the conversion of Russia if her requests were heeded. And four, and if her requests were not heeded, she warned of terrible punishments. So let's consider each one of those in more detail. First point, world peace has been entrusted to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Our Lady told the children that God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. Blessed Jacinta commented on what this means. This is from Sister Lucia's writing. Jacinta said to me, It will not be long now before I go to heaven. You will remain here to make it known that God wishes to establish in the world devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. When you are to say this, don't go and hide. <coughs> Tell everybody that God grants us graces to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, that people are to ask her for them, and that the heart of Jesus wants the Immaculate Heart of Mary to be venerated at his side. To them also to pray to the Immaculate Heart of Mary for peace, since God is entrusted to her. Close quote. Pray to the Immaculate Heart of Mary for peace, since God has entrusted it to her. Second point, Our Lady made three requests. She places three conditions for world peace. The three conditions are, first, pray the rosary. Quote, pray the rosary every day in honor of Our Lady the rosary in order to obtain peace for the world and the end of the war, because only she can help you. Close quote. So praying the rosary is the first condition for world peace. Second, the five comedians of reparation on first Saturdays. Before the outbreak of hostilities in World War II, Sister Lucia wrote, Whether the world has war or peace depends on the practice of this devotion, along with the consecration of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That is why I desire its propagation so ardently, especially because this is also the will of our dear Mother in Heaven. 
She also wrote, Our Lady promised to delay the scourge of war if this devotion was prom propagated and practiced. We see that she will obtain remission of this chastisement to the extent that efforts are made to propagate this devotion. So making the five uh, first Saturdays is a second condition for world peace. And third, the consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart, Our Lady. I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion reparation of the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. So the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart is the third condition for world peace. So the three conditions are pray the rosary, make the first five Saturdays, the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart. Third point, Our Lady promised peace in the conversion of Russia if her requests were heeded. Quote, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. Fourth point, she warns of terrible punishments if her requests are not heeded. Quote, the war is going to end. She's speaking at this time of World War I. The war is going to end, but if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. When you see a knight illumined by an unknown light, know this is a great sign given to you by God that he's about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the Church and the Holy Father. To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the con consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart, the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the Church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, various nations will be annihilated." Close quote. There's a lot here, so we'll briefly touch on World War II first, and then in a few minutes we'll consider the errors of Russia. World War II. Our Lady speaks of the war, war and of preventing it. If people do not cease offending God, a worse war will break out during the pontific of Pius XI. To prevent this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. So Our Lady of Fatima did that on June 13, 1929. She appeared to Sister Lucia while she was making a holy hour in the chapel of the convent in Tui, Spain. Our Lady, the moment has come when God asked the Holy Father to make, and even with all the bishops of the world, the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart, promising to save it by these means. We can get some ideas of the effects of such a consecration by considering the case of Portugal. On May 13, 1931, in response to Sister Lucia's urgings, the bishops of Portugal consecrated their country to the Immaculate Heart. The results were, one, a striking rebirth of Catholic life, two, an almost unbelievable rise in vocations, three, a complete political and social reform in line with Catholic social principles, and four, Portugal was given peace and spared from both the Spanish Civil War and the Second World War. In the spring of 1936, our Lord told Sister Lucia that the conversion of Russia would only occur when it was solemnly and publicly consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary by the Pope, together with all the world's bishops. In October 1942, without the bishops, Pope Pius XII consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. In 1952, without the bishops, Pope Pius XII consecrated Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. In May 1967, Pope Paul VI renewed the consecration of the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary again without the bishops. In June of 1981, St. John Paul II renewed the consecration of the world, again without the bishops. In May of 1982, St. John Paul II renewed the consecration of the world, again without the bishops. In May, on March 25th, 1984, St. John Paul II renewed the consecration of the world to the Immaculate Heart with the bishops. The Pope wanted to consecrate Russia by name, but as Bishop Paul Joseph Cortes explains, for di diplomatic and ecumenical reasons, quote, at the suggestion of his collaborators, he abandoned the idea, close quote. During the actual ceremony, the very words of the Pope himself made it clear that the consecration itself hadn't been done. During the consecration of the world, not Russia, the Immaculate Heart, he states, obviously referring to, the, to Russia, quote, enlighten especially the peoples of which you yourself are awaiting our consecration, confiding. Close quote, St. John Paul II. This is all reported in uh, the Vatican newspaper, L'Osservatore Romano, on March 26, 1984. I'm very well aware of the controversy on this point. You're free to take your own position there, but I'll put my money on the Pope. My way of looking at it is if the Pope said the consecration hasn't been done, then it hasn't been done. 
There's another reason these arguments that the consecration was done finally in 1984 don't make any sense to me. Since in 1980, not 1991 and again in 2000, John Paul II repeated the consecrations of the world to the Immaculate Heart. So suit yourself. In any event, it's obvious that Russia has not converted. Russian Orthodoxy is certainly not Catholicism. And as we'll see, her errors are still spreading throughout the world. Back to Our Lady. When you see a night illumined by an unknown light, know that this is the great sign given to you by God that he's about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the Church and the Holy Father. The secret had not yet been published when on the night of Tuesday, January 25th, 1938, there was an astronomical event so spectacular it made not only the papers, but also the scientific and astronomical journals. For example, I read from one. Wednesday, January 26, 1938, quote, An aurora borealis of exceptional size furrowed the sky of Western Europe last night. It caused an uproar in a number of regions, which at first believed it to be a gigantic fire. In the entire region of the Alps, the population was very much intrigued by this strange spectacle. The sky was ablaze like an immense moving furnace, provoking a very strong blood-red gold. Close quote. The roar was seen all over the whole of Europe, and across North Africa, and even Bermuda and Southern California. Immediately afterwards, Sister Lucia explained the significance of this event to her bishop, her provincial superior, and her confessors. As she wrote in her third memoir, quote, God made use of this to make me understand that his justice was about to strike the guilty nations. Close quote. In 1967, Colonel Sierra, he was a cardinal patriarch of uh, Lisbon from 1929 to 1971, testified, quote, I can add that the imminence of this war and its violence and extent was communicated to the Bishop of Lierra seven months before its beginning. Indeed, I had in my hand the letter where the seer called the war predicted by Our Lady imminent and promised Our Lady's protection to Portugal thanks to the consecration or immaculate heart made by the Portuguese bishops. I don't know what became of this letter. I possess a summary of it drawn up by the bishop shortly afterwards, which says the following. The principal chastisement will be for the nations that wanted to destroy the kingdom of God and souls. Portugal is also guilty, will suffer something, but the Immaculate Heart of Mary will protect it. The good Lord desires that Portugal make reparation and pray for itself and for other nations. Spain was the first to be punished. She's referring to the Spanish Civil War there. It has received its chastisement, which is not yet over, and our approach is for others. God has resolved to purify in their blood all the nations who want to destroy his kingdom and souls. And he promises to be appeased and grant pardon if people pray and do penance. Close quote. God has resolved to purify in their blood all the nations which want to destroy his kingdom and souls. And yet he promises to be appeased and grant pardon if people pray and do penance. If it were true in the 30s, that God was resolved to purify in their blood all the nations which wanted to destroy his kingdom and souls, then what ought we to think of our times and of our nation? Sometimes we'll hear the objection, but why would Our Lady say this, the war would break out during the pontificate of Pius XI? The war didn't start in 1938 or during the reign of Pius XI, but rather in 1939 during the reign of Pius XII. Hitler himself gave the answer. In a speech, speech to the Reichstag, that's the German parliament, on January 30th, 1939, Hitler stated that he had decided on the invasion of Austria in January of 1938. If people do not cease offending God, a worse war will break out from the pontificate of Pius XI. It's estimated that the total number of deaths in World War II were about 50 million. After the war, a priest asked Sister Lucia, it's a shame that the secret was not published before the war. Why didn't you make it known earlier? Sister Lucia replied, because no one asked me to. Now that's not a flippant answer. It actually reveals an important point. Frere Michel explains, it was not God's will that Sister Lucia reveal the secret on her own authority, without the consent of her superiors. There's often a grave misunderstanding of God's designs at Fatima. His prime purpose was not to warn the people directly and democratically for them to convert. This would have been the case if Sister Lucia had published the prophecies of the secret on her own initiative. God's design is entirely different. 
He wants to save the world through devotion to his Immaculate Heart of Mary, but he also wills that the pastors of his church be the ones who establish this devotion solemnly, using their God-given authority. Close quote. God wants to save the world through devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, but he also wills the pastors of his church be the ones who establish this devotion solemnly, using their God-given authority. And they haven't. We need to pray. Not complain, that doesn't do much good. How many times have we heard pious Catholics complain with good cause about the pastors of the church? The bigger question is, are we praying for them? Are we praying for them? When Our Lady showed the vision of hell to the children, it's not like the damned souls were only the laity. As we pointed out yesterday, St. John Chrysostom, that great bishop, father and doctor of the church states, I do not speak rashly, but as I feel and think. I do not think that many priests are saved, but that those who perish are far more numerous. We need to pray. Let's turn to Russia. Our Lady, if my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she'll spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, various nations will be annihilated. As we know, her requests were not heeded. World War II broke out, Russia did not convert, still hasn't. We all know that. But although the Cold War ended, Russia's errors are still spreading throughout the world. This is such a vast subject that we don't have time to focus on two specific areas. And even then, we're only going to cover those in the broadest outlines. We'll start by considering the political and cultural errors of Russia. And again, we have only time to touch on this in a superficial manner. For the most part, what falls in this section is essentially the work of William Lynn, Timothy Matthews, and Linda Kimball. All I've done is just stitch a bunch of quotes together. <clears throat> Marx's theory taught that when a great war finally broke out between the nations, the working class would unite and overthrow their governments. Why? Because according to Marxist theory, the workers of the world have much more in common with each other than they do with the bourgeoisie and the ruling classes in their own countries. Okay, but when World War I broke out, the workers of the world did not unite with each other. They fought each other. The British working man fought for Great Britain. The French working man fought for France. The German working man fought for Germany, and so forth. Not surprisingly, it turned out that any given working man was more loyal to his country than he was to, to counterparts from other countries. From Marxist perspective then, World War I was a colossal flop. In 1917, after the last apparition of Fatima, after the miracle of the sun, the Marxists finally seized power in Russia. It looked like the theory was working, but the revolution still didn't spread. After the war, a series of attempts were made to spread the revolution. With the briefly lived uh, Soviet Republic of Bavaria, they held power for six months in 1918 and 1919. The communist uprising in Berlin in 1919, and the Soviet Republic of Hungary, which held power for 133 days during 1919. But once again, the workers didn't support these, and these Marxist regimes each quickly collapsed. Something was wrong. Marxists had a problem. So working independently, two Marxist theorists, George Lukács of Hungary and Antonio Gramsci of Italy, came up with the same solution. So they're credited with being the fathers of the Western version of Marxism. It's called cultural Marxism. They both taught that communism was impossible in the West until both Western civilization and Christianity were destroyed since they had blinded the working class to its true Marxist interest. George Lukacs recognized the great obstacle to the creation of a Marxist regime was Western civilization itself. As he said, quote, I see the revolution and destruction of society as the only solution. A worldwide overturning of values cannot take place without annihilation of the old values and the creation of new ones. Close quote. So there we have the agenda of cultural Marxism in a nutshell, explained by one of its creators. I see the revolution and destruction of society as the only solution. A worldwide overturning of values cannot take place without annihilation of old values and creation of new ones. In 1919, when he became the deputy commissar for culture in that short-lived Marxist regime in Hungary, Lukács got his chances to put his theory into action. He immediately introduced sex education to the public schools. 
Because if cultures to be destroyed, traditional sexual morals simply have to go. We'll return to that point later. Antonio Gramsci, the other creator of cultural Marxism, argued that the West would have to be de-Christianized by means of what he entitled the long march to the institutions. What he meant by this is the culture must be the new battleground, and all cultural barriers to the acceptance of Marxism must be removed or reconfigured according to Marxist principles. All cultural barriers to acceptance except in a Marxism, should be reconfigured. Starting with the family, going through churches, the arts, the cinema, theater, literature, science, history, entertainment, schools, colleges, universities, seminaries, civic organizations, the organs of mass media, newspapers, magazines, radio, now television, and so forth. Pat Buchanan comments on the long march. In other words, they had to get into the culture and change the people's way of thinking. And if people were thinking about patriotism and nation and God and country, that was too resistant to Marxism. It could never take hold. So you had to erode and destroy that individual, in the, the individuals. That became what was called the long march of the institutions, through the seminaries, through the churches, through the media, through Hollywood and all the rest of it, to create an anti-Christian culture which will destroy the Christian beliefs and convictions in the vast majority of the people. So they embraced the ideas they had rejected. And they would be open to a takeover, basically, by Marxists. Not political Marxists, but cultural Marxists. Close quote. The great historian Christopher Dawson reflected on the consequences for a society to lose its common principles and ideals. And that's the explicit goal of the cultural Marxism. Christopher Dawson, quote, It is easy enough for the individual to adopt a negative attitude of critical skepticism. But if the society as a whole abandons all positive beliefs, it is powerless to resist the disintegrating effects of selfishness and private interest. Every society rests in the last resort on the recognition of common principles and common ideals, and if it makes no moral or spiritual appeal to the loyalty of its members, it must inevitably fall to pieces. If society as a whole abandons all positive beliefs, it's powerless to resist the disintegrating effects of selfishness and private interest. Every society in the last resort rests on the recognition of common principles and common ideals, and if it makes no moral or spiritual appeal to the loyalty of its members, it must inevitably fall to pieces. Well, here we are, watching what pr precious little uh, remains of Western civilization falling to pieces, or more accurately being smashed to pieces. The question is, how did this move from Marxist theory into the wider culture? How do we get here? Given the time, we have only t time to focus on the work of the Frankfurt School. George Lukacs played an instrumental role in the founding of the Frankfurt School in Germany. The school was founded in 1923 with a primary goal of translating Marxism from economic terms to cultural terms. And the guys in the school included uh, such men as Herbert Marcuse, Theodore Adorno, Eric Fromm, uh, Wilhelm Reich. The Frankfurt School might have only turned out to be little more than a historical oddity had Hitler not come to power in 1933. Given that every member was not only a Marxist but also Jewish, they fled Germany. With the help of Columbia University, the school reestablished itself in New York City, at which point they shifted their attention and focus from destroying traditional Western culture in Germany to destroying it in the United States. They believed there are two kinds of revolution, political and cultural, and they kept focused on the cultural revolution. One of the members, Herbert Marcuse, comments, quote, one can rightfully speak of a cultural revolution, since the protest is directed towards a whole cultural establishment, including the morality of existing society. There's one thing we can say with complete assurance. The traditional idea of revolution, the traditional strategy of revolution has ended. The ideas are old-fashioned. What we must undertake is a type of diffuse and disper disper disintegration of the system. Close quote. So they can rightly speak of a cultural revolution. The protest is, is focused towards the whole cultural establishment, including the morality of existing society. What we must undertake is a type of diffuse and dispersed disintegration of the system. They also realized that the working class was not going to lead a Marxist revolution because it was becoming part of the middle class, the bourgeoisie. Who then would lead the revolution? In the 1950s, Marcuse answered the question. A coalition made up of blacks, students, feminist women, and homosexuals. 
By crossing Marx with Freud, they invented something called critical theory. Critical theory involves making the most destructive criticisms of every possible cultural norm in order to destroy the current social order. For example, everyone who's successful in business or has a position of power in the church or state is labeled as an oppressor. Those who are not successful are victims. Someone who defends the notion that there's actually different social roles for women, men and women as a male chauvinist, pig, or fascist. Uh, fathers of bishops are patriarch, tyrants, and so on and so on. They took a long view and in their unfortunately influential writings continually poured out contempt on the different institutions, the traditional family, the churches, the arts, the cinema, theater, literature, science, history, etc., etc. In institutions of so-called higher education, the cultural Marxism of the Frankfurt School is more commonly known as multiculturalism or more loosely known as political correctness. The Frankfurt School also adapted the technique of psychological conditioning. Quote, today, for example, when the foot soldiers want to do something like normalize homosexuality, they don't argue the point philosophically. They just beam television show after television show into every American home where the only normal seeing white male is a homosexual. Uh, the Frankfurt School's key men spent the war years in, in Hollywood. Timothy Matthews summarizes specific recommendations of the Frankfurt School. One, creation of racism offenses. Two, continue change to create confusion. Three, the teaching of sex and homosexuality to children. Four, the undermining of schools and teachers' authority. Five, hum huge immigration to destroy identity. Six, the promotion of excessive drinking. Seven, emptying of churches. Eight, an unreliable legal system with bias against victims of crime. Nine, dependency on the state or state benefits. Ten, controlling and dumbing down of media. Eleven, encouraging the breakdown of the family. Close quote. We don't have time to consider each one of those topics in detail. We'll just take a, a few minutes to consider a few of the attacks by the cultural Marxists. Attack on the family. One of the principal goals of the Frankfurt School is to destroy traditional relationships between men and women. Timothy Matthews, quote, to further their aims, they would attack the authority of the father, deny specific roles of father and mother, and wrest away from families their rights as primary educators of their children. Abolish differences in the education of boys and girls. Abolish all forms of male dominance, hence the presence of women in the armed forces. Declare women to be oppressed class and men as oppressors. One of the basic tenets of critical theory is the necessity of breaking down the contemporary family. The Frankfurt School scholars preached that even a partial breakdown of parental authority in the family might tend to increase the readiness of a coming generation to accept social change. Even a partial breakdown of parental authority might intend to increase the readiness of a coming generation to accept social change. The drive towards no-fault divorce, towards homosexual marriage, so-called marriage, the, re the relentless denigration of traditional father in the mass media, the phenomenon of, of feminism, these things didn't arise out of a vacuum. Educational theories. Followers of the Frankfurt School introduced the sensitivity training or values clarification techniques used in public uh, and or Catholic schools over the past 40 years. In those sessions, uh, for those of you who are blessed to be spared of this, a moral problem was presented. For example, a lifeboat problem. And, you know, as I recall, we were presented at the ripe old age of, of 13 years old with a moral dilemma. So either you have this lifeboat that can only hold maybe five passengers, and we're given a list with a description of 20 people, the pregnant woman, the doctor, the lawyer, etc., etc. And then we're supposed to figure out who's, who's going to be allowed on the boat. So you get this intractable moral problem is, is presented to kids. And then during the whole exercise, the teachers don't guide, teach, or answer any questions with moral absolutes. In fact, a teacher who would do that would be guilty of indoctrinating his students. This would violate the moral freedom of the student. The students had to be free to choose their own values. The students had to be free to choose their own moral code. And the role of the teacher was simply to facilitate the student to that end. The real lesson and these exercises has absolutely nothing to do with lifeboats or any other of the moral situations. The real lesson is that there are no absolutes. Each man has to come up with his own moral code. The real lesson is that there are no moral absolutes. Lessons are designed to praise the average kid in a very real quandary and make it very difficult for him to believe in the existence of a transcendental moral law. That's the goal. What's the result? The result is moral chaos. Marcuse was clear about the goal. One can rightfully speak about, uh, of a cultural revolution since the protest is directed towards whole cultural establishment, including the morality of existing society. Politically correct speech. The cultural Marxists use words as weapons, 
not as means of conveying truth. The whole notion of political correctness has its source in the Frankfurt School. In order not to be thought of as racist or fascist, then someone can't be judgmental. Not only is he required to be non-judgmental, that's a uh, PC term which correctly translated means he must reject conforming his judgment to the laws of God. Not only is he required to not be judgmental, but he also must embrace a whole host of politically correct moral absolutes, cultural Marxist absolutes, which include diversity, choice, sensitivity, sexual orientation, reproductive rights, sex education, safe sex, safe schools, safe environments, inclusion, and tolerance. One blogger had uh, some penetrating insights as to the actual function of politically correct speech. I quote, Political correctness is communist propaganda writ small. In my study of communist societies, I came to the conclusion that the purpose of communist propaganda was not to persuade or convince, nor to inform, but to humiliate. And therefore, the less it corresponded to reality, the better. When people are forced to remain silent when they are being told the most obvious lies, or even worse, when they're forced to reply, repeat the lies themselves, they lose once and for all their sense of probity. To assent to obvious lies is to cooperate with evil, and in some small way to become evil oneself. One standing to resist anything is thus eroded and even destroyed. A society of emasculated liars is easy to control. I think if you examine political correctness, it has the same effect and is intended to. Close quote. I think it's right on the money there. When people are forced to remain silent or when, when they're being told the most obvious lies, or even worse, when they're forced to repeat the lies themselves, they lose once and for all their sense of probity. To assent to obvious lies is to cooperate with evil and in some small way to become evil oneself. One standing to resist anything is thus eroded and even destroyed. A society of emasculated liars is easy to control. Here's a, one illustration taken from a European blog of the reality that political correctness erodes the ability to resist evil. I quote, Early in June 2006, Canadian police arrested a group of men suspected of planning terror attacks. The group was alleged to have been well advanced on its plan to attack a number of Canadian institutions, among them the Parliament of Canada, Toronto subway, and a possible beheading of the Prime Minister. However, the lead paragraph of the Toronto Star story on the rest was, an investigator's office, an intricate graph plotting the connections, the links between the 17 men and teens charged with being members of a homegrown terror cell covers at least one wall. And still says a source, it is difficult to find a common denominator. Royal Canadian Mounted Police Assistant Commissioner Mike McDonald said that the suspects were all Canadian residents and the majority are citizens. They represent the broad strata of our community. Some are students, some are employed, some are unemployed, he said. Parenthetical note, I just got to, this is so, you know. They've just located a terrorist cell, among other things, wants to behead the Prime Minister, but the Mounties can't find a common denominator linking these terrorists. Now there's a mystery without a clue, right? Okay, anyway. However, there was one common denominator for the suspects that wasn't mentioned. They're all Muslims. Well, surprise, 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 surprise. The Toronto, Toronto Police Chief Bill Blair noted proudly during the press conference following the arrest, I would remind you, there's not a single reference made by law enforcement to Muslims or the Muslim community. Close quote. When people are forced to remain silent, when they're being told the most obvious lies, or even worse, when they're forced to repeat the lies themselves, they lose once and for all their sense of probity. To scent to obvious lies is to cooperate with evil in some way to become evil oneself. One's ability to resist anything is thus eroded and even destroyed. Mass media. In 1937, in his encyclical on atheistic communism, the Pope was already warning the world about the relationship between the non-Catholic press and international communism in 1937. It certainly hasn't improved over time. I think we can just take it as a given that the media are largely controlled by cultural Marxists. I don't want to waste our time submitting evidence for something that's so self-evident. The sexual revolution. The very phrase, the sexual revolution, was coined by a member of the Frankfurt School, a Freudian psychoanalyst, Wilhelm Reich. As E. Michael Jones has pointed out, Reich discovered the best way to attack the social system, which rested on the authority of the Father, who represented the authority of God the Father on Earth, was to persuade the young person to engage in sexual activity before marriage. Once God's out of the picture, the authority of the Father disappears. With that, the whole social order based on the moral order collapses, since sexual morality is the foundation of social order. Obviously, getting the man involved in a sexual revolution was not the great challenge. 
The great problem is getting the average woman to participate, since in a fling, she has a lot more in stake. Nikolai Lenin, quote, the success of a revolution depends on the degree of participation by women. Close quote. The success of a revolution depends upon the degree of participation by women. It's the same thing since the Garden of Eden. When the serpent wants to destroy the moral fabric of the society, he attacks the woman. That's where he starts. Reich saw that when he was dealing with an individual woman, he had a very hard time breaking down her moral standards and inhibitions. As long as she made difficult to corrupt, the revolution could not move forward. I'll edit, I'm, quote, I'm quoting Reich, but it's, it's edited. When I talk to a woman in my office about her sexual needs, I'm confronted with her entire moralistic system. It is difficult for me to get through to her and convince her of anything. If, however, the same woman is exposed to a mass atmosphere, for example, at a rally in which sexual issues are discussed clearly and openly, then she doesn't feel herself to be alone. After all, the others are also listening to forbidden things. Her individual moralistic inhibition is offset by a collective atmosphere of sexual affirmation, a new sexual morality which can paralyze, not eliminate, her reactions. The new sexual morality assumes a socially accepted status, bringing it to a head under the pressure of a mass ideology." Close quote. So if, if we want to understand this culture war we're in, we need to understand this point. By his study of psychology, and I'd submit to you by being guided by demonic inspiration, Reich discovered a way to effectively corrupt women in massive numbers. As he saw, individual women were difficult to corrupt. But if they're immersed in a social situation where it seems like everybody's doing it, they have a very difficult time preserving their moral inhibitions and standards. If that sounds far-fetched or unbelievable, listen to this. This is not taken from a story about Reich. In a lecture several years ago at Loyola College in, in, in Baltimore, this is a so-called Catholic college, the professor stated that sexual promiscuity and hooking up among college students is voluntary. That wouldn't sound too controversial. His point was sex among college students is voluntary at, the, at this Catholic college. Now remember that Ma Reich has made the claim that if a woman is placed in a large group in which forbidden things are discussed or acted out, then in that atmosphere of social pressure, she has a hard time upholding her moral standards. The article from which this following quote was taken has nothing to do with Reich. But in light of Reich's claims, listen to this response to the professor's statement that sex among college students is voluntary. Quote, a young woman in dormitory resident advisor walked up to me afterwards and chided me. Dr. Gorian, you are mistaken about that. The peer pressure and the way things are set up makes promiscuity practically obligatory. It doesn't matter what the school says officially. The rules are to be broken. This freedom can make girls dizzy and unsure of whatever else they believe about saving oneself for marriage. When it seems like everyone else is doing it, it is hard to say no. I deal with it, or more frequently turn my eyes from it every day as an RA." Close quote. The peer pressure and the way things are set up makes promiscuity, promiscuity practically obligatory. This freedom can make girls dizzy and unsure of whatever else they believe about saving oneself for marriage. When it seems like everyone else is doing it, it's hard to say no. Elsewhere in the essay, the professor writes, In most American college co-ed dorms, the flesh of our daughters is being served up daily like snack jerky. The gates are wide open and no guard dogs have been posted. Nor are daughters the only ones getting hurt. The sex carnival that is college life today is also doing great damage to our son's characters. I'm witnessing a perceptible dissipation of manly virtue in the young men I teach. I'm prepared to ask whether America might not be lost because a great middle class was persuaded they must send their children to college with no questions asked, when in fact this was the near equivalent of committing their sons and daughters to one of the circles in Dante's Inferno." Close quote. The techniques suggested by Reich in breaking down the moral inhibitions of women were used literally out of his books at things like Woodstock and similar musical fe festivals of the, of the sexual revolution of the 60s. They're used today in sex ed classes. They're a reality in almost all college dorms today. The fashion industry, uh, the porn drenched mass media, and most especially the entertainment industry, each play a crucial role in sustaining this atmosphere because, as Lennon so correctly pointed out, the success of the revolution depends on the degree of participation by women. Please don't think they had no idea what they were unleashing. We need to realize in regards to the sexual revolution in the West, 
The culture of Marxists had a very clear idea of what a society in the throes of sexual anarchy would look like. Very clear. In 1956, Pichirim Sorokin, who's a Russian sociologist that had been exiled after the revolution, described just such a society, quote, most instructive is the radical attempt of the Soviets to eliminate capitalistic monogamy and to establish complete sexual freedom as a cornerstone of the communist economic and social regime. During the first stages of the revolution, roughly from 1918 to 1926, the, the institutions of marriage and the family were virtually destroyed within a large portion of the urban population and greatly weakened throughout the whole Russian nation. There was a period of sex anarchy in which the leaders deliberately attempted to destroy marriage and the family. Free love was glorified by the official glass of water theory. If a person is thirsty, so with the party line, it is immaterial what glass he uses when satisfying his thirst. It is equally unimportant how he satisfies his sex hunger. The legal distinction between marriage and casual intercourse was abolished. The communist law spoke only of contracts between males and females for the satisfaction of their desires, either for an indefinite or definite period, a year, a month, a week, or even for a single night. One could marry and divorce as many times as desired. Husband or wife could obtain a divorce without the other being notified. It was not even necessary that marriages be registered. Bigamy and even polygamy were permissible under new provisions. Abortion was facilitated in state institutions. Premarital relations were praised and extramarital relations were considered normal. The old pragmatic test, by their fruits you shall know them, provides the answer to the question whether this sexual freedom was practical. Within a few years, hordes of wild homeless children became a real menace to the Soviet Union itself. Millions of lives, especially of young girls, were wrecked. Divorces skyrocketed, as did also abortions. The hatreds and conflicts among polygamists and polyandrous mates rapidly mounted, and so did the psychoneurosis. Work in the nationalized factories slackened. The total results were so appalling that the government was forced to reverse its policy. The propaganda of the glass of water theory was declared to be counter-revolutionary, and its place was taken by official glorification of premarital chastity and of the sanctity of marriage. Abortion was radically curtailed and divorce was made impossible for the vast majority of citizens." Close quote. By this time, uh, Lenin had died and as, as Stalin and mass power he clamped down. It's important to realize that guys like uh, Wilhelm Reich and Herbert Marcuse were very familiar with the results of this social experiment of sexual anarchy in the Soviet Union. And that didn't determine the slightest. They knew exactly what to expect. Before we leave this point, let's note that Wilhelm Reich made another key discovery, a key discovery that has borne great fruit in the long march of the institutions. Reich found it was completely useless to debate the existence of God with a seminarian. He found it was completely useless to debate the existence of God with a with seminarian. But as Dr. E. Michael Jones points out, Reich saw clearly that the God, idea of God evaporated from the minds of seminarians. It became enmeshed in sexual vice. The idea of God evaporates in the minds of seminarians who become enmeshed in sexual vice. Reich's discoveries had practical application in seminary formation, at least here in the States. One example of many in the late 70s in a scandal which was publicly exposed at the time, Father Kenneth Unterner, he was a rector of St. John's Seminary in Plymouth, Michigan, showed the seminarians uh, triple X hardcore movies. He later moved into a position where he could inflict even more damage um, because he was the bishop of Saginaw then from 1980 till he died in 2004. The idea of God evaporates from the minds of seminarians or priests or bishops who become enmeshed in sexual vice. Of course, it wasn't just the culture of Marxists who targeted the seminaries. Bella Dodd was a communist who served as legal counsel to the Communist Party of the United States until Bishop Sheen brought her into the church. She stated that, quote, in the 30s we put 1,100 men into the priesthood in order to destroy the church from within, close quote. Those men weren't necessarily communists. They were young radicals. And the idea was for them to be ordained and then strive for positions of influence and authority. In 1953, Manning Johnson, another former official of the Communist Party in America, testified before the House Un-American Activities Committee, quote, the tactic for infiltration of religious organizations was set by the Kremlin. In the earliest stages, it was determined that it would be necessary to concentrate communist agents in the seminaries because these institutions would make it possible for a small communist minority to influence the ideology of future clergymen in paths conducive to the communist person. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. 
If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. Our Lady's requests were not heeded. As we've seen, Russia has spread her errors through the world. Before we leave this topic, a few remarks from Cardinal Burke. Before he went to Rome from St. Louis, Archb he's Archbishop at that time in St. Louis, he said that as Catholics continue to speak out on life and family issues, they will face persecution. There's going to be a persecution with regard to this, that's clear. We live, as our Holy Father says, in a society of a culture of death, where people want to convince us that everything should be convenient and comfortable, and they don't like to hear a voice which says, this isn't right. Bishops will be persecuted, he said, and also priests and lay people. It's what it means to be a sign of contradiction. We just have to accept that. We have to remain tranquil and proclaim the truth with charity, but insisting on the truth. If we look to the example of our Lord, we have to take up the cross for defense of life. We'll close this section with a few comments from Pat Buchanan. The United States has undergone a cultural, moral, and re religious revolution. And militant secularism has arisen in this country. It's always had a hold on the intellectual and academic leagues. But in the 1960s, it captured the young in the universities and colleges, and we had this great battle. Culture war began then nationally. And since then, secularism has really achieved dominance in the academic community, in the, 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 the intellectual community, the entertainment community, and Hollywood, among parts of the political community, but not the nation as a whole. Harvard is much stronger than it was, and so this is the basis of this great cultural war we're undergoing right now. It is a militant, anti-Christian, anti-God, anti-traditionalist revolution, and so we're two countries now. We're two countries morally and socially and culturally and theologically, and culture wars do not lend themselves to peaceful coexistence. One side prevails and the other side prevails. And the truth is, well, the conservatives, in my judgment, won the Cold War with political and economic communism. We've lost the cultural war with cultural Marxism, which I think has prevailed pretty much in the United States or is now the dominant culture, whereas those of us that are traditionalists are the counterculture. Close quote. Culture wars do not lead themselves to peaceful coexistence. So we've taken a superficial look at the political and cultural areas of, of Russia. That's, after all, when we speak of the areas of Russia, most people think to, tend to think in terms of Marxism, Leninism, and Communism. And it's all true. But we need to also remember that when Our Lady was speaking to the children, the Communist Revolution had not yet taken place. At that time, Russian Orthodoxy was a religion of, the, of that country. It's impossible to understand the errors of Russia without considering religious errors of Russia, the errors of Eastern Orthodoxy. And in that light, we'll mention only four of the principal errors of Orthodoxy that are of particular interest tonight. The first and most serious error uh, pertains to Our Lady. As we've heard, the reason for the communities of reparation on the first five Saturdays is to make reparation for five different kinds of off offenses and blasphemies committed against her Immaculate Heart, the first of which are blasphemies against her Immaculate Conception. And that's precisely what the Orthodox do. They deny she was Immaculate Conceived. The second error pertains to the Orthodox concept of church unity and the role of the Pope. We quote from an Orthodox website. Quote, in practice, the Church of Constantinople has functioned for centuries as a church responsible for guiding and preserving the worldwide unity of the family of self-governing Orthodox churches. But it must be noticed that this responsibility is merely a practical and pastoral one. The Orthodox churches govern themselves, electing their own bishops and organizing their own lives. There's no one dominating authority in the Orthodox church, no particular bishop or seer document which has authority over the churches. Close quotes. So the Orthodox have splintered themselves into, into all kinds of particular independent national churches. They don't recognize any ultimate authority, and in so doing, uh, they reject the clear gospel teaching of Christ regarding the primacy of Peter, the Bishop of Rome, over the church. So that's the second error. Third error pertains to marriage. Again, we quote from an Orthodox website. Quote, the Orthodox Church recognizes the sanctity of marriage and sees it as a lifelong commitment. However, while the church stands opposed to divorce, the church in its concern for the salvation of its people does permit divorced individuals to marry a second and even a third time. Second or third marriages are performed out of concern for the spiritual well-being of the parties involved and as an exception to the rules, so to speak, close quote. So the Orthodox, who claim to be uh, faithful to the teachings of Christ, allow a man to keep turning his wife on a new model for a grand total of three wives. I, I don't know why three. If you can do this, what, 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 why do you stop there? You know, why not two dozen? It's just bizarre. Anyway, in so doing, they've totally and completely corrupted the clear gospel teaching of Christ regarding the indissolubility of marriage. So that's the third error. Fourth error pertains to Holy Communion. The Orthodox allow these divorced and so-called remarried people to receive Holy Communion. And it is Holy Communion. 
They're real priests. In other words, by allowing a divorced person to live, living in sin with someone who's not really his spouse to receive Holy Communion, they officially allow sacrilege. And in so doing, have totally and completely corrupted the scriptural and apostolic teaching regarding the proper disposition required to receive Holy Communion worthily. That's the fourth error. So those are some of the religious errors of Russia. And in point of fact, each one of the last three years has been heavily promoted at the recent synod. Thereby, whereby the Orthodox churches govern themselves, electing their own bishops and organizing their own lives, has been promoted on their synod under the title of decentralization, by arguing that the power should pass from the Holy See to the bishops' conferences of the various nations. And of course, the heirs of the church somehow recognizing people living in sin as being actually married and then compounding that scandalous recognition by expending, extending these poor sinners an official invitation to make sacrilegious communions have both been heavily promoted at the Synod. In other words, many of our so-called Catholic leaders have embraced these religious errors of Russia and so doing are literally actually advocating for pastoral practices that will bury their people in the depths of hell. The very depths of hell. They hate us. It's satanic. We've got to call things what they are. Let's be clear. That's exactly what we're talking about here. We still have to love them. We don't have to like them. We have to love them. It's the command of our Lord to love our enemies. We pray for them. We pray they get saved. We pray they convert. But it's clearly hate us. If you love people, you don't try to make it easy to go to hell. One last note here. We'll read one question from an interview given a few years ago by Carlo, Carlo Cafara of Bologna. Question. We know you were given charge by John Paul II to plan and establish the Pontifical Institute for the Studies on Marriage and the Family. Cardinal Caffetta. Yes, I was. At the start of this work, entrusted to me by the servant of God, John Paul II, I wrote to Sister Lucia Fatima through her bishop, as I couldn't do so directly. Unexplainably, however, since I didn't expect an answer, seeing that I only had asked for prayers, I received a very long letter with her signature, now in the Institute's archives. In it we find written, quote, the final battle between the Lord and the reign of Satan will be about marriage and the family. Don't be afraid, she added, because anyone who operates for the sanctity of marriage and the family will always be contended and opposed in every way because this is the decisive issue. And then she concluded, however, Our Lady has already crushed its head. Sister Lucia said the final battle between the Lord and the reign of Satan will be about marriage and the family. All right, what to do? I'll start with a few recommendations. Given that cultural Marxism is now the dominant culture in the West, it's growing stronger by the day, it's not like we can remove ourselves or hermetically seal our, our lives in such a way as to remain completely unscathed by our surroundings. Nevertheless, we should all be thoughtful by taking special care to limit the impact of the popular culture, by thoughtfully limiting or, or even eliminating the direct influence of mainstream media, be it television, papers, radio, what have you. We need to bathe ourselves as much as possible in things that are true and beautiful and good. Good music, good literature, so forth. Most especially surround ourselves with friends that are serious about their eternal salvation. We should make every effort humanly possible to hear mass and circumstances conducive to the faith. It's essential in raising children. It's precious little good to teach the children the faith at home and then bring them into circumstances where the actions speak louder than the, your words. We need to pray. Pray the rosary every day and do the five first Saturdays and then start all over again. Wear your brown scapula. Everyone here is undoubtedly consecrated their home to Sacred Heart. That's a way of pro proclaiming him as the king uh, with your home enthronement. You need to consecrate yourselves and uh, your home to the Immaculate Heart too. I would especially recommend the 33 day, uh, day consecration uh, to Our Lady it's a, of St. Louis de Montfort, True Devotion to Mary. He describes that in his books, The True Devotion to Mary and The Secret of Mary. If you haven't been consecrated to Lady, then, then do that and pray. We already spoke of praying for pastors of the church. We need to pray especially for the Pope, and we need to pray for the consecration of Russia. Most especially, we need to pray the Rosary. We'll close tonight with a few thoughts from Sister Lucia. This is in our interview, the last public interview with Father Augustin Fuentes. It's December 26, 1957. After this, she was silenced. 
Father Gaston Fuentes met with Sister Lucia at a convent in Coimbra, Portugal. He was able to converse with the Fatima Sierra at great length. He gave a conference on the meeting which he reported Sister Lucia's work. Father Alfonso, the, Alonso, the official Fatima archivist for 16 years, stressed that the account of this conference was published with every guarantee of authenticity with due Episcopal approval, including that of the Bishop of Fatima. Father Fuentes affirmed that the message came from the very lips of the principal seer. Sister Lucia told me, the two means for saving the world are prayer and sacrifice. Regarding the Holy Rosary, Sister Lucia said, Look, Father, the Most Holy Virgin, in these last times in which we live, has given a new efficacy to the recitation of the Rosary. She has given this efficacy to such an extent that there is no problem, no matter how difficult it is, whether temporal, above all spiritual, in the personal life of each one of us, of our families, of the families of the world, or of the religious communities, or even of the lives of peoples and nations, that cannot be solved by the Rosary. There's no problem, I tell you, no matter how difficult it is, that we cannot resolve by the prayer of the Holy Rosary. With the Holy Rosary, we will save ourselves. We will sanctify ourselves. We will console our Lord and obtain the salvation of many souls. The Most Holy Virgin, in these last times in which we live, has given a new efficacy to the recitation of the Rosary. She's given this efficacy to such an extent that there's no problem, no matter how difficult it is, whether temporal, above all spiritual, in the personal life of each one of us, of our families, of the families of the world, of the religious communities, or even the lives of peoples and nations that cannot be solved by the rosary. There's no problem, I tell you, no matter how difficult it is, that we cannot resolve by the prayer of the Holy Rosary. With the Holy Rosary, we will save ourselves, we will sanctify ourselves, we will console our Lord, and obtain the salvation of many souls. There's no problem, no matter how difficult it is, we cannot resolve by prayer the Holy Rosary. Say your rosary. Say your rosary.